So I want to pass on the red stapler to you, Andrew. And I would like to have a prayer of commissioning for Andrew. Because even though uh, she's going to a business downtown, her boutique downtown, this is no mere boutique selling clothes to her. She has a heart for making a difference in ladies' lives, for sharing Christ with them. And this is the next step in her journey for doing that full time. So I would like for us to stand and pray for her that God would use her in that ministry. If you can't stand, that's fine. Just pray where you are. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that you would continue to use Angie powerfully in this new phase of ministry in her life. Lord, whatever happens with that business, wherever she goes, whatever she does, may she continue to have that heart for you. May she continue to bring the sunshine of Christ into people's lives. And Lord, I pray that you would lead her and that she would be listening and watching for your opportunities every day in that storefront. May she find them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Speech. No speech. Oh, you wanted her to have a speech? I didn't even think of that. That would have been cruel and unusual punishment. As far as our prayer concerns, uh, hopefully you received the, the last list on Wednesday. I want to especially uh, encourage you to remember those caring for parents and loved ones. We have several uh, in our church family that are doing that every day, and uh, that is can be very draining. I want you to be especially in prayer for our children who are trying to go to school, teachers who are trying to teach them in this mess. And college students, their whole lives have been kind of overturned and put on hold in many ways by what's going on. So be in prayer for them. Owen Balderson, who is CEO and Kathy Balderson's son, is having kidney surgery on October um, 5th, I believe it is. Uh, Donald's daughter, uh, Angie, if you would please continue to remember her um, as she declines somewhat. Uh, remember him and his family. Gary is uh, still recovering and doing well as can be expected. Please pray for his pain, as uh, his joint pain, as he continues to try to deal with that. And uh, Sue Duncan is recovering at home from her knee surgery, and she's doing well as, as well. Rather than going to physical therapy, she's trying to do that at home. So the torturers come there uh, to work on their knee. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now. <clears throat> Father, I know with my heart that there are people right now that aren't on this prayer list, haven't spoken up about their concerns, but they are carrying a heavy load this morning. They have worries and concerns, and their hearts are broken over different needs. We take those to the cross right now. We take those to you. Father, I pray that you would be with us in our weakness and our need. And Lord, even when things are going well, help us to remember you and take our cue from you. Lord, we, as we usually are, our minds are crowded with concerns. And with news, Lord, help us to stop and remember you now, to worship you with all our hearts, to hear your word as we open up Esther to chapter 8, Lord. Help us to hear what you had to say. Help me to hear what you had to say. We give ourselves to you, and we ask that you take these offerings that we're going to give now, Lord, and use them for your service and not our own designs. Only in Christ we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Lord, how we need you. And uh, now we give our thoughts to you. I give my mind to you. Uh, to help us as we open our words. Our, our, uh, your word as we hear you. Lord, I pray that you continue to bless the settled family. And uh, that you would walk with us in this coming year. In Christ we pray. Well, on some, some downtime, I watched a video online of a high-speed police chase in California. And this man was in a high-performance sports car, and he must have been going well over 130 miles an hour on the freeway, just weaving in and out of traffic like it was standing still. Didn't even see any police cars. I guess they were trying to stay a distance or they were trying to catch up. And this went on. The video was, I guess, about 10 minutes long. And uh, it went on and you thought he was going to wreck and he just continued to, to go his merry way, blasting through red lights and, and everything else. Finally, he ended up getting blocked up in an intersection as uh, police cruisers were there waiting for him and had already blocked it off, and they were coming up behind him, and they were blocking off the side streets because you can't outrun the radio. They had completely <laughs> encircled him and trapped him in. And, boy, and it, the video was taken from a helicopter because the police were following him by helicopter as well. And everyone, they just came to a screeching halt all around him in a big arc, threw their doors open, everyone had their guns out. I mean, the guy had nowhere to go at all. Well, you can't, remember that old, old song, you can't outrun the long arm of the law? It really is difficult to do that. And in our text this morning from Esther chapter 8, the law of the land, however unjust and however bad it is, however ungodly it is, cannot be revoked. It can't be taken back. It can't be fought against. I won't bore you by going through the whole story of Esther again up to this point. If you've been here up to now, you already know what's going on. Uh, Esther has and her people uh, are had been delivered by God. Her cousin Mordecai, who had kind of a low totem pole administrative position, has been lifted up to the top position. Their arch enemy, Haman, who had passed a terrible edict with the kings, helped to completely wipe out the Jewish people. He has been executed. And now we find in Esther chapter 8 that Esther falls down on her face before the king and begs him for mercy for her people. That this law has been put out there and it's still in place that on a certain day it's going to be open season against the Jews and any, anyone can kill uh, a Jew or take their property. And she just begs him to please take back that law. And in verse 8, he basically acknowledges that the king's law, uh, that if it's an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring, it cannot be revoked. It can't be taken back. We'll see what he does in a second. But I, it leads me to my first point that I think that, I, that we really can draw from this passage that, that I'm hearing from this situation. And that is, stop trying to outrun the long arm of God's law. Now here you have a situation that's not just, laws that aren't right. But God's law, what is right, what is wrong, what he will bless, what he will punish, cannot be revoked or taken back. We can make excuses for ourselves. We can deny that that standard of right and wrong is out there or that God's word isn't relevant for us. But none of that can outrun or move us beyond the fact that God's holy law, God's holy word, stands. And it cannot be revoked. I remember in 
college, the first time I had to fill out taxes for the IRS after I had a paying job, I was, up to that point, I've been filling out these easy forms, and I'd always get a refund every year. It was wonderful. I mean, every year I'd get a refund. I'd get money I didn't even pay him. I'd get it back. Now, all of a sudden, I was working and trying to support a, a future and a family for myself. I guess this was in a seminary. And I filled it out, and I did the paperwork, and hope heaven... Heaven surprised me with the fact that I owed 600 something dollars to the IRS. And I was horrified. And I called up my dad on the phone. I said, Dad, this is terrible. I, I always get a refund. This year I have to pay $600. I don't have $600. Do they have some kind of installment plan or something? And he just laughed. He let me believe that. He laughed at me and said, No, son, you just got to pay. But I can't pay. I'm sorry. You gotta pay. I couldn't outrun the IRS. And there are people who just try to ignore it. Just don't file taxes or don't pay what they should. Don't think that they forget about that, right? They're coming for you, right? And you're guilty until proven innocent in, in a large measure. Now, when it comes to God's law, what he has described in Scripture as far as what is right and what is wrong, we may deny it, we may try to dodge it, we may feel like we've, we've got a fast life that can outrun it. But time will catch up with every single person who tries to call wrong right and right wrong. And that consequence may catch up with us in this life, as it usually does, or in the next. But it's coming. In the Bible, we find in Romans 3.23, the simple truth that says, For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. Now I want to show you my children's message right now. In the middle of the sermon. What I have here is a strand of pearls. And they're fairly expensive pearls that were given to Tammy years and years ago. And they broke. They snapped. She handed it to me. Because, you know, I'm quite a handy man. She handed it to me and said, you know, can you fix this? Can you do it? And in my ignorance, I thought to myself, well, yeah, I'll just tie it up or something like that. If you know anything about strands of pearls, it's one long strand of silk, and you put each pearl on and tie the knot, and then put the next pearl on and tie the knot all the way around to the clasp. And if that strand breaks at any one place, you can't just fix it. The whole strand of pearls has to be undone and every pearl taken off and you have to restring it with a brand new string. It's like that when we do something that's wrong, when we sin, maybe when we're mean to our parents or to our brother or sister. I'm speaking in terms that a child can understand, but I'm sure you all know what sin is too, you know? We can't just fix it. And just do better at that one point. We need a new heart. The whole string of being right with God is broken. And that's why Jesus came. To give us a new heart. To help us to start over in Him. Because you can't outrun the long arm of the law. But God has made a new way. The wages of sin is death, as chapter 6, verse 23 of Romans says. But take the new way that Christ has made. My mother read this book to me when I was a little boy, Little Pilgrim's Progress. You may have heard of Pilgrim's Progress. This is Little Pilgrim's Progress. And in this story, it kind of paints a picture of a Christian's life, 
uh, in terms of someone who's making a long journey. And the, the character in Little Pilgrim's Progress is a little boy, and he begins to realize as he learns about God that he is carrying this terribly, terribly heavy backpack everywhere he goes, and it just seems to get heavier and heavier, and it burns at his shoulders, and he can't walk as far as he used to walk, and he tries to take it off, and he can't take it off or set it down. And it just seems to get worse and worse and heavier and more burdensome and more painful as time goes on. And what that is meant to illustrate is when we begin to study God's Word and to realize how good He is, to realize what is right, and to realize how much God loves us, and to realize what He requires of us, and what is right and is wrong, we begin to not only point fingers at other people, but to, re to realize that we're part of the problem. I'm part of the problem. And when we realize that we have sinned, we're selfish, and I have problems, and I have not treated God as I should, and I have not treated my wife as I, as I should, and the list goes on, it becomes like a heavy burden on us. And we try to do better, and it just gets heavier. We try to blame other people for our problems, and it doesn't fix it. And we try to deny that we're really that bad, you know, we're okay in the balance of things, maybe we'll do okay in the judgment, and the backpack just gets heavier. I want to read to you what my mother read to me when I was a little child, and I still remember the night that she read this to me where little Christian presently came to a place where there was a little hill by the side of the road. And upon the hill, he saw the very thing for which he was longing. There stood the cross. And the moment little Christian began to climb the path that led to it, the bands which fastened his burden were breaking. Then it fell from his shoulders and rolled to the bottom of the hill. And when he turned to see what had become of it, he found that it was quite gone. Do we continue to sin and mess up? Yes. But Jesus has given us himself in a new law of grace that doesn't revoke or cancel out the old law, but it overcomes it in victory. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we, while I, was still a sinner, Christ died for us. Not just for good folks. Good folks don't need the Son of the living God to be crucified. Folks like me, folks like you, and in 623 of Romans, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Back in Esther chapter 8, here you have this law that they couldn't escape, that the Jews were going to be annihilated. The king cannot reverse that law. It can't be revoked. But he hands his ring, his signet ring, to Mordecai who's now acting as his son, if you will, who's now acting as king and all of his power and authority. And he says, Mordecai, you write whatever law needs to be written. And he writes another edict in addition to the first to be sent out on all the couriers to the corners of the empire that says that on that day that the Jews were to be written, wiped off the face of the earth, the Jews, the king says that the Jews can stand up and defend themselves and take whatever plunder from their enemies they want to, and this is with the king's blessing. And of course, everyone knows now that the king is looking with favor on the Jews, and so they're a little bit taken aback and scared after to death, and it overcomes this problem. 
Just like God has overcome our problem by the sacrifice of Christ. Now, as I've talked about before, we Christians talk about getting saved. And uh, we talk about trusting in Jesus and being forgiven of our sins, spending an eternity with Him rather than an eternal death. And that is right and good for us to concentrate on. It's the center of, of the gospel message of what we're all about. But as I've talked about many times, what breaks my heart is the fact that Christians often are just saved. I and God don't want you, and I don't want to be just saved. I want to live in victory and joy. I want eternal life to begin now. As, as it does in a sense, illustrated in chapter 8, when everyone hears about this grace that has come from God, it says in verse 15 that Mordecai, who's now acting for the king, when they hear about him, they shouted and rejoiced. And in verse 16, the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city and wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many peoples from the country declared themselves Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. Now they were excited and they were full of joy because their lives were saved. What what if the Jews had heard about it and said, okay, great, we're saved, and then gone ahead through their day of worry, not getting excited, not looking up, heads hanging down? How ridiculous would that have been? Almost as ridiculous as a pastor or as Christians hearing about God, that he loves you. That all your weaknesses and all your mistakes and all the wounds that you carry in your heart of hearts and in your mind and in your memory that you can't seem to get past. And there doesn't seem to be any hope. Jesus came to free you from yourself. To free you from your past. To give hope. To give eternal life. And yet we continue to go through life with heads hung low. Oh, it's terrible. The world is awful. You know, on Friday, I was here alone in the church and uh, had my lunch right there in the fellowship hall. And I sat down and kind of addicted to my smartphone, as my wife will tell you. So I, I took my smartphone out and I started to scroll through news stories as I was eating my lunch. Probably should have been praying, but that's okay. God spoke to me anyway, even through a smartphone. And as I was reading one story, I stopped dead in my tracks and stopped eating and just read this story. It's a story about a foster family. Now, a little three-year-old child had been neglected, maybe even abused, and he came to stay with this foster family. And obviously they knew that uh, his past was very difficult because he wouldn't even sleep in a bed. He didn't really know what that was. He would just sleep on the floor. Uh, he wouldn't sit at the table for meal times. The whole concept of sitting down and having a dinner with the family or with other people was completely outside of his experience. He'd just sit on the floor and drink milk. And for several years, this foster family tried to love on him, tried to patiently deal with him, tried to help him. And he began to connect with them. He began to open up. And he slept in the bed. And he would talk to the family. And he was able to begin learning. And it was still very difficult, but he began to move 
forward, and the time came for him to be adopted by another family. One of the difficulties of being a foster parent is that you have to say goodbye to this child that's come to your home. He left and went to that adopted family, and apparently after a year or so, that did not work out. They couldn't handle him. And they sent him back into the foster system. And at six years old, he came back to this family, the same foster family. One day, the father heard what all parents dread sometimes, the sound of silence. And he knew something must be wrong. He went into the living room, and there was that little boy named George sitting on the floor, and the family portrait that was there in the living room, the glass was broken and shattered, and the frame was actually broken apart. And he had that picture of his foster family, and in the middle of that picture was a little stick figure where he had drawn himself. And that was the only way he could to express the longing of his heart to be a part of this family. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. I probably haven't cried for three years. I'm one of those people that finds crying difficult. But I went back to my study and I wept like a baby. Not just for George, for this new story, but for the realization of a million people like George and the pain that they are carrying. And I began to think of you, just what little I know of your lives and the loads and the burdens and the pain that you are carrying every day. And it broke my heart because I am painfully aware of the fact that I can't make a difference. At least I don't feel like that I can do anything to solve that. And I felt so small and so useless and so weak. And yesterday, as I was preparing for this sermon, I came to the quiet realization that, yes, I don't make much of a difference in this world. Jesus does. In Jesus, there is healing. In Jesus, there is victory. In Jesus, there is hope against all hope. In Jesus, we, in all the pain that we face, and all the messed up world that we live in, have joy. He is enough. Father God, we're broken in many ways. We're broken. And we live in a broken world. We don't even know how to express our deepest longings. We don't know how to heal ourselves. We don't know how to forgive ourselves. Sometimes we can't even admit that we're wrong. But this morning we come to Jesus. This we know. We're yours. We trust in the cross and we trust that you were alive and that you love us. And right now, if there's someone who needs to experience the healing of Jesus, I can't provide that. This church can't provide that. We can express it. You can do that through us, but in ourselves, we can do that. If there's someone here who needs to ask Jesus into their heart and their lives, Lord, don't just, don't just have, let us have the illusion of thinking we can fix some part of our lives, Lord. We need the whole strand replaced. We need you in our lives. And we give ourselves to you right now. Jesus' name, if there's someone here, as Tara plays softly on the piano, I'm going to be 
just waiting with the mask on over here by the picnic table. If you'd like to pray or make a commitment to Jesus, give your life to Him, you are welcome to come forward or to pray right, right where you are or to stay after the service. Amen. <laughs> stand as we pray together. Father God, we are yours. And we need your blessing and your help for this week. We can't understand how to live, but we follow Jesus. May that be enough. Help us to get to know him better. Hold us up. Forgive us. Guide us as we look to you. All God's people said in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.